So now we're on to our last speaker, Professor Don Jones. He did a BSc in Applied Biology at Nottingham Trent University, followed by a PhD in Cancer Drug Metabolism at the MRC Toxicology Unit, Leicester. His postdoc, still within the MRC, used LCMS and mass spectrometry methods to look at early markers of cancer, culminating in a lectureship and an expansion into looking at markers of cardiovascular disease. In 2017, he was given a chair in the translation of biomarkers and directs the Van Geest Biomarker Facility at the University of Leicester, looking for novel markers of disease using targeted and non-targeted methods, as well as integrating novel data handling strategies. Um, thank you, Juliet. Uh, it's very kind, and thank you for the invitation. Coming to Florence is a great privilege, and I'm enjoying both the city and, and the meeting to date. So today I'm going to talk about our strategy uh, for looking for biomarkers. Well, I'm going to talk predominantly today about cardiovascular disease and the sample preparation, the analysis, and also the role that progenesis plays in this. But we're, we do more than just cardiovascular. We do cancer, diabetes, renal. And ultimately, this is how we can use plasma proteomics uh, in precision medicine. So to that end, uh, at Leicester, uh, we've taken a decision to bring in a number of specialities and bring them into a single institute, the Leicester Precision Medicine Institute, and this is going on in several universities. So we'll have specialisms in cardiovascular, cancer, respiratory, and diabetes, and renal. And this will be underpinned by an analytical group, which is me and my team, and also a genomic group. And so we should be really able to look at the large cohorts that we have in Leicester. And one of the, the, the very good things about Leicester is we have a very large patient cohort. That's not to say that everyone's ill in Leicester. It just happens to be that we have a very large patient cohort. And we have specific peculiarities regarding ethnicity, for example. We have a very large South Asian population which have their own complications in certain diseases. So this is fabulous for doing research on. And so one of the things that we always talk about is right treatment, right patient, right time. I should say though, for me, there is no real definition of precision medicine. It's one of a catch-all phrase that seems to be used for different things. And clearly, it will be different in different disciplines. So my laboratory is the John and Lucille Van Geest Biomarker Facility. This was set up through a philanthropic uh, donation, but it's got funding from other groups now. And we take a fairly straightforward uh, uh, route to finding biomarkers. So we do what we call agnostic studies. This is simple uh, discovery studies. This is followed up by uh, targeted studies for these biomarkers in larger cohorts, thousands of patients and then into translation. And again, we're quite fortunate. We, uh, in the UK, the NHS funds a lot of research in health through the NIHR, and we have a uh, biomedical research center, which, which the whole pr uh, primary reason for this is to accelerate discoveries into the clinic. So within the lab, we've had a number of successes in terms of publications with uh, biomarkers, not all found by um, uh, proteomics, but ultimately um, our aim is to find biomarkers that can aid in the management of disease. Now, the argument for looking at plasma is well rehearsed and with a well-worn path, but I think it's worth talking about and just going through the rationale in as much as blood passes through um, each and every tissue and if there's a signal from that tissue that enters into the blood and we can measure that, that should give us some indication about the pathology of a disease or even health. Blood's also a constant volume. We don't have to deal with dynamic volume issues. And one overlooked point is that ultimately we need the clinical chemists to measure these things in chemical pathology labs. And proteins constitute the most commonly measured molecule in routine clinical chemistry. So they are well versed in measuring proteins. The other rehearsed arguments are the downsides to plasma proteomics. And um, Bruno Doman did this brilliant analogy of the scale of the problem with dynamic range. In his analogy, doing the 10 orders of magnitude, while in plasma, the concentration range is between 10 and 12. 
And of course, the big limitation with that is that the mass spectrometer can only look between four and maybe six on a good day. The other issue, which is, should be well known to most people, is that just a few proteins dominate the total concentration. And so there may be many thousands. So the typical strategy to date has been to essentially remove those uh, most abundant proteins using immunodepletion. And again, I'm not going to go through those particular arguments. There are pros and cons to these, and we did this for very many years, but we decided against it. Uh, primarily, there's two main reasons. The cost of immunodepletion is not cheap. And secondly, throughput. It impacts throughput massively. So it's often said, and there's many arguments about this, that proteomic biomarker discovery does not work. Okay, so the, 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 the argument is that there have been thousands of the discovered biomarkers in publications, and very few have made it over to uh, full FDA approval and full use in the clinic. And this valley of death for biomarkers, again, is well understood. We do know why this was, technological limitations, experimental design, you know, um, not properly powered studies, for example, often asking the wrong clinical questions and pre-analytical variation. And we can overcome these with a number of advances that have happened over the years. But there have been successes. So OVA-A is a multi-marker test for ovarian cancer diagnosis. Veristat is a really exciting test for looking, a predictive test of uh, EGFR uh, activity for lung cancer, and then Harold Mishak's got this assay for looking at chronic kidney disease, and he's got not full FDA approval, but this FDA letter of support, which means he can feed into clinical trials, which is really exciting for the field. So I'm going to give two examples of the kind of work we do, and uh, like some of the previous speakers, I'm not going to go step by step how we use progenesis, but really I was going to talk about some of the features that I, we find really useful for us. So coronary artery disease is a major problem. Uh, huge advances have been made with uh, statins and, and control of blood pressure, but it's still a major issue. And essentially, you need arteries that are pumping uh, blood to the muscle. And if those arteries become blocked, then you can't get sufficient oxygen. And then you get several other complications. You may get a heart attack or heart failure or ischemia. Uh, or angina, and so this is again a very serious problem, and particularly what we're looking at as well is the effect of ethnicity. So it seems that um, South Asians uh, are more predisposed to CAD than Caucasians, so it's just something we're very interested in discovering. So as I said, we kind of wanted to switch from uh, doing immunodepletion and fractionation and we decided to do a, a new novel method, which is this calcium silicate matrix. And essentially, we create a slurry. We add some uh, plasma to that. We let, allow that plasma proteins to bind, triptically digest. We then clean up using solid phase extraction. And then we do label-free LCMS and then protein expression analysis using progenesis. And we found this to be a really nice, uh, quick, and reliable method. So we have to have the obligatory schematic of a G2S. So uh, here it is. We use the G2SI. And we incorporate, uh, on the front end, we have a nanoacuity. We have eye mobility, also to give us great separation of peptides. And then we use uh, some research from other labs. So Stefan Tenza developed the UDMSE, where you use specific uh, collision energies for specific drift times. And this gives you much greater efficiency in terms of fragmentation. And because of that, you get more peptides and thus more protein IDs. I think you get more reliable data as well using that. So we utilize that. We utilize um, Bernard Custer's finding about DMSO. And we don't see any um, deleterious effects on seals and HPLCs. We, we, we have no evidence of that. And it does undoubtedly improve the overall uh, peptide numbers. And then we have this optimized chromatography, which is a weak spot within this whole point, in as much as this whole chromatography takes about 120 minutes, which isn't spectacularly bad. 
but really this isn't high throughput and I won't describe it as high throughput either but essentially we put two washes in that system and we we pretty much eradicate crossover carryover I mean and we can show that it's quite reproducible between samples so the features I was going to talk about I, I suddenly thought as I've sat there I should have talked about the QC page as well because that's a very for you it's the first thing you look at and you can check whether the, uh, how many miscleavages, how many peptides, how close the mass range is. So those, that, that is a really invaluable thing. One thing I like is the flexibility with normalization. So you can do, um, you can have no normalization and you can do that outside of the program. You can apply total protein, so total iron count normalization, which is our normal way of doing this. Or you can choose to do a set of housekeeping proteins, if you like. But we find this works, and when we export it, you can export it as both unnormalized and normalized, and we find that our data is much more robust when normalized, which is you know, that's obvious, I guess. The other thing which I think is for proteomics, uh, which is a major positive, uh, is that the way in which it works, it essentially establishes a composite map of all the peptides in all the samples. And there are two good things about this. The first is that you, you eliminate or reduce the amount of missing values. And for stats, that's really important. The other thing is, the more samples you put in, you invariably see more proteins. And you pick up more and more peptides and, more, and consequently more proteins. And so this is, for, for our lab and for our experiments, has been uh, really smart. Again, it, it sounds like a very similar workflow for the, for the metabolomics. You do peak modeling, alignment, peak picking, et cetera, et cetera, and it does the ID. So in this experiment where we did CAD, I should have said we had 100 uh, patients with CAD, 20 healthy volunteers, and in total we get about, two, let's say, 2,000 proteins, 1,900 proteins, of which about 1,200 are quantifiable. So. And the thing that I want to stress, this is from a single run, okay? We're not fractionating, we're not doing endless fractions, endless immunodepletion. This is from a single run, and we're able to get high quantitative value over 1,000 per uh, sample. And from uh, the exported data, we can do some OPLSDA, where we can show distinct separation between the groups, the CAD and healthy groups, and also then go on to do the kind of classic S-plot and look for the markers responsible for that discrimination. On the right-hand side, there are four uh, boxes uh, which are just ways of assessing our method. So this calcium silicate matrix method. One of the things that I was surprised at, because of course, the difficulty with plasma is that a lot of the measurements are pretty much at the bottom of the scale. You know, a lot of your measurements are there at the noise, frankly. But what we found with our method is about 70%, between 60 and 70% of all our measurements were under 20% COV. So that, that's a really, that gives us great confidence that this method is quite robust. And the other uh, slides really talk, um, just describe the kind of dynamic range you might see, a normal distribution of hydrophobicity in the peptides that we see. And this again is about reproducibility, but I'll skip that bit. You can do the simple, as described earlier, the PCA statistics using Progenesis QI for proteomics. And again, there are other, there's another tool in that particular page which, is re, which we use. Is, so clinicians come to us, they want, they want to take a step in the water, if you like, and so we do a small pilot study. And then you can do, the, it does a power calculation within this program. So we can then just go and tell them exactly how many samples we want etc. And that, that we use that practically all the time. So from this we can do univariate analysis where we can show discrimination between these different markers. These markers haven't been verified, that's the next step for that in the next six months, six to nine months. Uh, we'll be looking at a cohort of about 1400 uh, samples. And again, one of the things that you can do is just export your data very simply into other programs. Now, I'm not really an expert in these kind of programs. I've always been a bit um, not cynical. Um, I, I, of, I often see people put up diagrams exactly like this, and I think, well, actually, do they really tell you anything? And the only thing I will say is that for 
uh, for the site escape, we did a quantitative analysis. And what we did see is that specific groups in lipid, um, lipid transport, lipoprotein remodeling, lipid and carbohydrate metabolism, and immune inflammatory response were quantitatively changed. Now, these are exactly the pathways you'd expect to be changed in uh, CAD. So it gave us a lot of confidence in the overall method. The other th way that in which we use this um, calcium silicate matrix is for mouse plasma. Now, anyone who's used mouse plasma will know that typically you have to use very low volumes, and if you want to do serial uh, sampling, uh, even more so. So we, we just wanted to test whether we could use uh, six microliters of mouse plasma, and what you, I'm afraid you don't see very clearly is that we kind of show that if we take one family of proteins, the apolipoproteins, that we get good reproducibility and we can pick them all up. But what was really intriguing for us is that from the mouse, we could get troponin T, which is a very low concentration. And troponin is used uh, in the diagnosis of uh, heart attacks and myocardial infarctions. So the point that I've raised about this is, again, we get, sorry, about 1,700 proteins, about 1,200 are quantitative. What's really exciting for us is that we're in, in cancer particularly, but also in cardiovascular, a lot of uh, preclinical work is done in mice, and that needs to be translated to humans. And what we're showing here is what we effectively can do is exactly the same sample prep, exactly the same analysis, and then put them all into progenesis. So the whole pipeline is exactly the same from translation from mouse to human. So I think that's a real positive. I don't think there's any other way of doing that other than something very crude like acetonitrile crash or something like that. So hopefully we showed you multivariate and univariate analysis show clear distinctions between clinical groups and we've got endless examples of this. Um, we must have about 15, 16 projects at the moment that, all, that we're getting some really good results in. We're able to deeply mine the plasma proteome with over 1,000 quantifiable proteins. And I have to say, this is data from about nine months ago. We got some newer data, which shows about, about 2,500 quantifiable proteins now with a very big project we're doing. And this developed protocol can be used for both human translation for human and mouse plasma. By way of example, I thought I'd just describe another project and very quickly, won't go through the methods. I think this is only two or three slides. But heart failure, I should say my background was in cancer. And so I knew nothing about cardiovascular uh, disease particularly. And I always thought heart failure was, you know, it's okay. But I didn't know anything about it. But it's really bad. And its prognosis is particularly poor. So depending on the clinic, between 40 to 50% uh, of people diagnosed with heart failure will be dead within one year. So, you know, you're heading into the bad cancers in that kind of prognosis. So we need markers uh, to identify it. Again, heart failure is just the inability of the heart to pump sufficient blood to meet the metabolic needs of the body. And it, 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 often breathlessness and you get edema around the legs are the, the classic symptoms. So we've been involved in this fabulous project. It's an absolute gold mine, this project. It's, um, it's a Biostat CHF. Uh, it's pan-European. Leicester's leading the genomic and proteomic part of this. And essentially, it's a single experiment. We've taken 2,500 patients who've been diagnosed with heart failure through standard means. They're given optimized therapy to control their heart failure. Then we have 12-month outcome data. So these people have either survived, event-free, they're re-hospitalized with something like heart failure, they've had a heart attack, or they've died. So we thought what would be interesting, because it was our, um, our first experiment with this, just to take 50 survivors and 50 uh, death at one year and see if we could identify uh, a risk model. What we did is we identified six proteins which were significantly altered we put this into, uh, we used a model using SVMs, the support vector machines. And using this multi-marker uh, solution, we could get a rock curve. And for those who don't know, essentially, 
this allows you, this gives you a sense of predictivity for biomarkers, and in an in an ideal world, you'd have one, which would be 100% accuracy. And we've got a um, rock curve of about point, I think it's about 0.92, near enough, if we use the six uh, protein model. Now, this is good. This is really impressive. Most biomarkers are probably about 0.7 in clinical use, 0 0.7 to 0.8. And so this is really good. But what was really interesting to us is that we could create, using the Kaplan-Meier curve, a risk determination. So we could identify which patients were at low risk, medium risk, and high risk. Now, clinically, what does this mean? Well, it may mean we can go in with more aggressive therapy. We can um, just change their therapy, take them off, do, do whatever needs to do. But at least it would give us a good, a lot of cardiovascular disease is managed through risk scores. And so we've got a really nice way of developing the risk score for this particular one. And um, Tong uh, is my, one of my postdocs, and uh, he does all our progenesis work, and he did all this project. So it goes a bit whimsical, I'm afraid, in this um, discussion bit. Um, in as much as disease is a complex phenomena, who, who didn't know that? But it's driven through gene-environment interactions. And I often leave this slide in because I'm often arguing with genetic people, I have to say, and this is always aimed at them, that post-genomic changes are as important to understand, if not more. It's interesting, we heard a number of talks talking about multiple omics, which is invariably true. You can't do it with just one. But plasma proteomics, which has been... Uh, abandoned to some extent, but uh, it seems to have come back in fashion in the last year, uh, and that can allow the deep characterization of the plasma proteome. It can show you that it, it's useful in early diagnosis, <coughs> prediction of response to therapy, and indeed stratification of patients. And these are the cornerstones of precision medicine. And the incorporation of other omic platforms will uh, greatly strengthen any of these results. So I just want to acknowledge a number of people. So my clinical collaborator is Professor Leong Ong, um, who does all the stats side of this work. I lead the analytical side. Jody Pauline and Raj are the technicians who've worked on this project. Tong does all the informatics. And Dan and Liam have contributed in different ways to the project. And then the funding, the John and Lucille Van Gies Foundation, they've set up the lab. And then we've had funding from CRUK, BHF, EU, and others. And finally, thank you very much.